Bibles with you this morning, turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 2, starting at verse 13, the second half of verse 13, and we're going to read down through verse 16. We're in that new section of Scripture. Starting there in the middle of verse 13, they are stains and blemishes reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you. Having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. Having a heart trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he received a rebuke for his own transgression, for a mute donkey, speaking with the voice of a man, restrained the madness of the prophet. And this is God's word to us this morning. As we begin to think about uh, the character and ways of false teachers or continue to think about them, we want to make note that people that infiltrate places that they want to spy on or corrupt, people who do so are usually thought of as doing so under the cover of darkness, right? They do so in secret they, they want to do it in darkness so that you cannot discern their activities. They want to hide. They want to be secretive. They want to be undetected. Usually that's how it happens. However, there are those who do something that is perhaps even more devious more bold in the negative sense of the word, and that is they hide in plain sight. The idea behind that, of course, is to be out and about in a place that people looking for you would least expect. You wouldn't expect a false teacher to be found among the people of God, especially those who hold an orthodox view of the faith. And yet, that's what happens. Where do they least expect you to be? Right out in plain sight in the church. Right out in plain sight in the church. If someone can be right there in front of you and accomplish the same purpose, then that's all the better. Because they get a semblance of approval, right? If they're not caught, if they're not uh, corrected, if the teaching isn't confronted, and they've been in the church and they begin teaching, they're able to do so out in the open. Now apply this to what we noted about false teachers last time. What do they do? They count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. Out in the open for all to see. It gets to the point where Yes, they're hiding in plain sight, but they have been accepted for so long, right on along with everyone else. Now they can just be right out there. And they are accepted. Their secrecy, if you will, is hiding where you least expect. They use the cover of the church to introduce their destructive heresies to ultimately undermine the church and then to destroy it. And this is the end of what they do. Maybe their goal is to help the church get with it. Modernize, whatever phrase you want to use. 
They don't come right out and say they want to destroy it. But that is the result. And again, many a well-meaning student has gone to seminary, unfortunately, the more liberal seminaries that embrace modernism and, and so forth, and have been taught in the scriptures, or so they thought they would be taught in the scriptures. And they're, they're taught other things. And they begin to embrace it because, after all, these are the experts. And then they take what they have learned and they pass it on to the various churches in which they serve. And, of course, the people of the church, they say, well, that's our seminary, and he must know what he's talking about, or she must know what she's talking about. And they embrace the minister, all the while right out in the open, teaching contrary things. They hide in plain sight, as it were, to push their own agenda over God's agenda. They think maybe, in some cases, they think they're doing the right thing. But in the end, in the end, there's destruction. They pursue their own pleasures. Last time we looked at Titus, we sort of ended with that to see how Paul used the word, and here it is again. For we also once were foolish ourselves. Notice how he says that. We also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures. There's our word. Spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. So we take note of what we started saying last time. Paul here is speaking to the former life lived before salvation and knowledge of the Lord. And note well, Paul is including himself when he describes the foolishness of unbelief and the, uh, of unbelief and characterizes the life of an unbeliever as disobedient and deceived. Paul says elsewhere in 2 Thessalonians 1.8, they do not obey the gospel. And then he says that we were enslaved to various lusts and pleasures. And of course, as we mentioned last time, a slave is one who is controlled by a master. They're under the dominion of the master, of the master. We said this gives us some insight into what today we call addictions, in which the behavior, attitude, and so forth gets so ingrained in your life, and it's so ingrained in your life, it seems natural. It seems acceptable. Same way with the society at large. It seems so second nature in a way that I can behave in such a way that it just seems to come so naturally, not practiced at all. But we have to see it in the context that the scriptures put it, in the categories the scriptures put it. And Paul calls it being enslaved to our lusts and pleasures. We keep wanting more. and Boy, that made me feel good. So I got to do it again, but I got to have a heightened sense of it. I got to do more of it and so on. And I just keep indulging and indulging and indulging. Jesus, our own Lord, says that those who sin are slaves of sin. It seems to me that we need to adopt then the biblical picture of this more clearly and be forthright about the dangers of indulging the flesh because it leads to enslavement and a destructive lifestyle. And ultimately, it leads to death. 
Ultimately, it leads to death. We want to continue looking at how it is seen in their behavior. And I mentioned last time that James also says something about this. So we want to see the context in which James puts the use of this word pleasures. James says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. What you do is for your own pleasure instead of God's pleasure. So note well how James identifies the source of quarrels and conflicts. I believe certain translations use the word wars, in fact, instead of conflicts which shows you how devastating it is when you live by your pleasures. Think about war. Think about the impact of war. Think about the devastation of warfare and what goes on and the aftermath of it. It is sometimes utterly devastating utterly destructive. That which once stood proud and tall are leveled. People's lives are devastated and lost. That's the same kind of thing that happens living by your pleasures and seeking your own pleasures. Notice the fundamental battle that rages in our lives is the pleasures that wage war in our members. In other words, pleasures that arise as a result of the lusts of the flesh. And we fight with each other because we are self-centered and seeking to fulfill our own pleasures, our own wills instead of God's will. James cautions us also very strongly about how we ask. Sometimes we do not have because we do not ask. But when we do ask, we ask, James says, because we want to spend what we get to fulfill our pleasures. It can sound very spiritual, though, and we all, I'm I'm going to admit, I'm... I'm thinking we all fall into the trap or very tempted to fall into the trap. And and it sounds very godly. We can couch it in spiritual sounding words. I think God should have us do whatever it is that you think God should have you do. But, you know, it's just coincidence that you think that you should be doing that as well. You haven't really wrestled with the issue. You haven't really looked at it and sought the Lord's face about it. You're simply asking to spend it on your pleasures, James says. It's a cover sometimes. I've sought God about it. It's a cover at times to sound spiritual, but covers the self-centeredness of pleasure sinking instead of seeking what God desires. And again, it leads to a destructive life. It is a life counter to God's will, and it is very important that we understand this. We touched on it earlier, but we must emphasize it again here this morning. 
Notice that Peter says that they count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. To put it another way, they feed their pleasures by reveling in the daytime. And two phrases later, we find them reveling in their deceptions. Teaching the wrong things about who Jesus Christ really is. Teaching the wrong things about the Word of God. And saying, well, it may not be fully the Word of God, but it contains the Word of God. And if, or if you have the Holy Spirit and you read these writings, then the Holy Spirit will move you and speak to you, and then it becomes the Word of God. And it kind of sounds good, it kind of sounds right, but it's deception, clear and simple. As you read this in its context, it becomes clear that these pleasures are not the simple enjoyments that life has to offer as a child of God. There is nothing wrong with enjoyment. There is nothing wrong with enjoying life. There is nothing wrong with enjoying the life that God has given you. Be sure of that. It is, rather, the pleasures received in the indulgence of fleshly desires. Somehow we've convinced ourselves, well, if this much is good, then a whole lot more will be a whole lot better. And often it isn't. That is, the results of the engagement in that. <clears throat> this has an almost Gnostic feel to it in that the body of flesh is considered to be unimportant and so it may be indulged. If, if this body is nothing, if it's a body of sin, then indulge it all you want to. Feed the spirit to be sure but also indulge the flesh. First, we found that these false teachers were brazen in their blaspheming glories, and now secondly, we find that they are brazen in their indulgence of the flesh as they mingle, perhaps join, with the church. So they join in the love feasts of the church surrounding the table of the Lord, and are yet comfortable in their deception. Celebrating, I mean, think about it. Think about participating in communion. And you are in a church that has received a pastor from one of the liberal seminaries. And this pastor doesn't really believe that Jesus rose from the dead. He doesn't really believe that God raised him up in the power of the Holy Spirit and that he is alive forevermore and glorified and is at the right hand of the Father. And then, and then he participates in the Lord's table with you. It's an act of hypocrisy, isn't it? Because we proclaim the Lord's death, what? Until he comes. You can't really faithfully say, I believe that, and yet hold to the falsehood that Jesus didn't really get raised from the dead. And yet it happens in churches throughout this country and around the world. They're comfortable in their deception. If you sit them down and ask them, what do you truly believe? And they start telling you what it is, you would be surprised. And the question should obviously come to your mind, then why are you in a church?
They deceive. <clears throat> the whole of their life appears to be one of deceiving the other members of the church. And the kicker is they enjoy it. They enjoy it. The next phrase of the text says, having eyes full of adultery and that never cease from sin. The text literally reads, having eyes full of an adulteress and not ceasing from sin. And there are two ways in which we might view this phrase. The first way is that we have it translated in the text before us. They are looking to commit acts of sexual sin constantly. And it could very well be that these false teachers engaged in that kind of behavior as they are described as those who indulge the flesh in their fleshly desires, right? So it could be that. But it could also, secondly, have reference to something more fundamental as well. When Peter says that they are having eyes full of an adulteress and not ceasing from sin. I think it wise to keep in mind the accusations that the Lord brought against the people of Israel in the Old Testament through the prophets concerning their often called adultery. That is, Israel, among all other sins that were, they were committing, was fundamentally adultery. And why adultery? It is called adultery because God himself was their husband. And they were to be involved in the cultic practice of the temple where God's name was placed. They were not to be setting up the high places all over the country. They were not to be offering up sacrifices to the gods of the land and other peoples. But to their own God, they were to remain and be true. Israel's husband was the Lord of all creation. And when you chase after idols, that is, another husband, you are committing adultery. They gave themselves over to the participation in these other cultic practices of the nations around them, something of which the Lord himself warned against them doing. Be careful that you do not do so. Be careful that you do not follow in, if I can put it another way, follow in the culture of those nations that deny me. And so when your eyes are full of an adulteress, it seems to me that you are looking at something more fundamental here having to do with idolatry. Idolatry. What characterizes the lives of these false teachers? Peter says they never cease from sin, which is rooted in an idolatry of the heart. Beloved, that's really the bottom line. In all sin, it is the usurping of God's place that says, He no longer gets to tell me what is good and what is evil, but I will determine for myself, as my own little God, what is good for me and what is bad or evil for me to do. And that's idolatry. That's an adulterous relationship with the idols of the land. In either case, however you view that phrase, these false teachers were filled with sin and the expression of that sin and how they lived out their lives. Take a look at the next three phrase, uh, phrases. Enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, accursed children. I want, to, I want you to pay special attention to whom these false teachers go after. 
The text says they go after unstable souls. And so let me use an analogy here to help us get to the point. You may have, you know, watched the Animal Planet or Discovery or some other channel like that that has a narrator and they're looking at nature and those kinds of things and what animals do and the hunts they go on and those kinds of things. And I want you to think about that. When a predator, such as a lion, goes on a hunt, what does it look for? Does it look for like the middle of the strength of the pack or the the herd of whatever animal it is? Does it look for the strongest? No, it looks for the stray. It looks for the straggler. As it watches the herd of whatever the particular animal is at, the t- at that time go by, they look for the weakest of the herd. They look for the most vulnerable of the herd. They look for the ones that are the easiest to pick off. These false teachers, then, do not look for the more mature, faithful believers, but rather they look for the vulnerable within the church. Perhaps someone who is questioning a certain aspect of the faith, of their own faith, whatever it might be. Perhaps a newly converted Christian. And we need to understand that these false teachers don't approach these vulnerable ones or weaker ones, attacking them head on or their beliefs head on. Perhaps that would be too obvious. But instead, they entice or lure them by setting bait in front of them. They don't present something easy to discern and reject. They bait them, and they lure them, and they entice them. And once they catch them leaning their way, they capture them. These unstable souls are more likely new believers in the faith. Not necessarily so. Perhaps it's someone who hasn't really grown much or hasn't given much thought to anything, or maybe things have become routine in life and they're just comfortable and then someone else comes alongside of them and, and entices them with this interesting new teaching that's being developed. And what do you think about this? And doesn't that sound right to you? God wouldn't act in this way, don't you think? That's key for us. Hardly ever is is it a head-on collision. But it is an enticement and a luring. Surely they're not always new believers, but people who are maybe not settled as quite like they should be. Maybe they play on the fears of others, the concerns and fears and anxieties of others. Oh, you don't want to do that because this will happen. And they're led astray. And as an aside, this is why we emphasize quite often the need to be established and the need to be firm in your faith. Repetition going through it and going through it and being settled in it. Certainly from time to time being challenged in it as well. That's fine. But for the goal of making you more solid in what you believe. And of course, that's what the first chapter of this letter was all about. About being sure of your grounding. It is only by being firm in your grounding, being firmly grounded in the faith, that you can be sure in the faith or in the face of destructive influences, knowing that just as it came to Israel, it will come to the church. 
and that you will keep watch for it. And so, beloved, it is imperative for each of us to be well grounded in the faith. And you might say to yourself, well, I've had no problem here because you turn to the scripture and we go through it phrase by phrase very often. And I can see exactly what you're talking about. And however, beloved, you yourselves know how widespread various teachings are. They are prevalent and they go across the internet and the airwaves and television. And we need to remember that it is alluring or enticing. Just because a preacher is on TV or radio doesn't make him orthodox in his convictions and beliefs. Maybe he's found a clever way of enticing you and luring you in and separating you from your money. And so you give and you give and you're, you seem encouraged by this preacher and then something else happens and you are caught. They don't come right out and say they are false teachers. They're very subtle in their approach and they set the bait and they draw you in. It seems right. It seems good. How is it that they can be so dastardly and destructive in their approach or in their goals? They can be so because, as Peter says, they have a heart trained in greed. And I want you to think deeply with me concerning this statement that Peter made here. Although the word can reference those who are never satisfied and think that they either want or need more and more and more, and I think it goes deeper than that. It is an insatiable desire for more. It is from a heart that is never satisfied and never finds contentment. And so think covetousness. Think covetousness. So-and-so has this. You should have it too. They play on your desires. They play on fears and lack of contentment. It is the last of the ten words or ten commandments in the law of Moses. And we're going to be thinking more about that next time. And so as we wrap up our thoughts together today, when asked the question, what do you want out of life? We all too often think of things without restriction. If we think of it in terms of if money were no object, what would you like to do? And we indulge our fantasies a bit, right? However, in a short period of time, reality sets in. And we understand our place in the world. And we go about meeting our various responsibilities once again. Peter warns us that false teachers do no such thing. They are never satisfied. They keep going and going around and around, raising questions here and and an observation there and enticing here and there and alluring you in and doing various things. And they indulge themselves. They indulge themselves. However, they are not satisfied with keeping it personal. They seek to entice others to join them. And beloved, this is a cautionary tale for us sent by Peter that we watch out for the welfare of our brothers and sisters in the faith. Beloved, there are constant warnings, right, that are put out over the airwaves and by various institutions telling us to never give out personal information. And they try to hammer home the importance of not being taken in by those seeking to do us harm. But remember, it is both subtle and enticing, and it is convincing. 
somebody on the phone addressing you, hey, I'm so-and-so from the Social Security office, and I just need to verify your identity. So if you could just tell me your Social Security number, and then you just start saying it. And it leads to destruction. That's what false teachers do. People who seek to fool you into doing something that you would never seek to do otherwise are very good at what they do. If you ever get a phone call like I have, we kind of make light of it now, but I, we got a message on the phone. This is agent so-and-so from the IRS, and your name came up in, an, in the middle of an investigation, and you need to call us. But, and if you don't call us, there's going to be a warrant put out for your arrest. <laughs> Sounded convincing. I mean, it did. Identified himself, everything. Gave, gave us his name, a telephone number to call out in Washington. Right? Except <clears throat> the IRS never calls you. They don't even email you. They send you a letter. But how many phone calls did he make? Right? Seeking to lure somebody in. Seeking to catch somebody off guard. Seeking to play on the fears of someone. The concerns of someone. And the next thing you know, this person is picking up the phone, dialing that number, and giving out all kinds of information. It's what false teachers do. They don't, see, you, they don't care if you don't respond. They just move on. That's why we have to look out for the welfare of the body of Christ. And false teachers are that way. They promise you things that God never promises. They set before you all the shiny objects to entice you in whatever way they can. They will seek out the most vulnerable among us. However, we have our glorious Lord who watches over His church and seeks to protect it. If we follow him, we will be protected. If we follow him and embrace the truth that he gives to us in his word, then when someone seeks to undermine that, we'll catch it right away because we have been so ingrained in the truth. He sets up for us discerning elders and others with understanding to guard against those who would seek to destroy. And may I commend our elders once again, taking the opportunity to do so and thanking God for the elders that he has put in place here at Lake Phelan Community Church. Elders that sharpen each other, that engage in discussions and are concerned about the welfare of the sheep. May our God grant us continued help and strength, whatever then may come our way. Our gracious God and Father in heaven, we thank you for your word to us this morning and the warnings that you present to us through the Apostle Peter. And we thank you for his faithfulness. We thank you, O Lord, for this written record that we might get to see the behaviors and characteristics of false teachers and what they're really after. And so we give you praise and thanks, O Lord our God. We give you thanks for the elders that you have put in place here and the protections you have put in place for those who lead by example, 
As you, O Lord, safeguard your church, grant us strength to follow you always. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.